stay hungry, stay foolish. The philosopher Alan Watts once said, the relationship between the environment and the organism is transactional. The environment grows the organism, and the organism creates the environment. For over 20 years, researchers and scientists have been discovering the links between our physical surroundings and the creative mind. Our guest today is author of My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation, Donald Rotner, Welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan, and thank you for having me. It's fantastic to have you on the show. I'm so delighted to have you here, particularly in these times where we're at home and many people are struggling with their creativity at home. We don't need to be architects ourselves to take action on the ideas in the book. Before we get into those 48 actionable ideas, we are going to talk about a bit of context, how you introduce the book, why all the science and neuroscience behind all these changes, all the research. You've done a very, very deep job on this, but I thought the way we'd start is as you do so many of your keynotes with a question. How many people here live at home? Okay, so I asked this question and you know, some people immediately raise their hand. Some people look at me like, what are you, why are you asking such a kind of obvious self-referential question? But I, I let everybody kind of get into a frame of mind that thinks about their relationship to their homes, which today, of course, is even more intense than in years past, given the pandemic. And once that's kind of sunk in, I say, now how many people would like to improve their creativity, connecting home with creativity and specifically improved creative performance? And that kind of sets the table for everything I'll talk about later in the conversation. One of the main goals of both your keynotes, your talks and your work is to unlock creativity from our environments. And that's why I mentioned that Alan Watts quote at the start, because so many of us now are working in home environments, home offices, perhaps it's going to become more and more the way going forward. And if the environment is not set up aptly, we're going to struggle with our creativity and we're going to struggle with our productivity. So I'd love you to share a little bit of backdrop before this, before we start diving into how we can interact with our environments. We as living organisms are extraordinarily attuned to our environment, to our surroundings in ways that a lot of times we're not really even aware of, but there's a good reason for this. It's a kind of legacy of our evolutionary development, right? The only way humans could survive on the African savanna or in prehistoric days was to be incredibly sensitive to what was going on around them. If they weren't, they were subject obviously to attack and predatory animals and bad things like that. So this genetic tendency to be super attuned to what's going uh, on around us is still in our genetic profile because think about it, it took us millions of years to evolve as biological creatures. Only in the last literally flick of an eye have we left the natural environment, right? Where there's no intermediary element between us and our surroundings, no walls, no floors, no ceilings, no heating, no supermarkets to feed us. We were in direct connection with our setting but just recently, we've shifted almost 180 degrees in the opposite direction where we now spend upwards of 90% of our time indoors, probably even more now because of COVID. And so our brains simply haven't had enough time to catch up to the fact that we're living space age lives with stone age brains. And we get all of these curious anomalies in our behavior and our reactions to our surroundings, which I've tried to kind of uncover in the course of this book to make people more aware of them. And then having this information to leverage them to their positive advantage. Because if you know a certain environmental condition stimulates a certain type of thinking, whether it's creative or analytic, you can obviously manipulate Manipulate your environment by applying that condition to your own setting. Beautiful. And you give context to this to all your work, which I love the research part. I'm a bit of a nerd like that. I like knowing the science behind it. And you look at such a wide range of research. 
You mentioned a 1950s address by J.P. Guildford, and I didn't know this is where these two modes of thinking came from. I'd love if you'd share this. So J.P. Guilford is, was a very famous psychologist at uh, the time, 1950, he was the head of the American Psychological Association, and they were having their annual meeting, I believe it was in Pennsylvania, and he was giving the keynote. And basically what he did was to take his colleagues to task, I guess you could say, excoriate them for not having made creativity a subject of their research. So this is 1950. There had been, I think according to his count, I think the number I give in the book is 186 articles, uh, journal pieces, peer reviewed journals, uh, having to do with creativity out of the tens of thousands that were published in the years past. Uh, and he basically says, look, we need to make creativity part of what we do, part of what we understand from a psychological perspective. And this keynote, and, and I, you know, people give keynotes all the time, but this one was revolutionary because if you chart the number of research articles, the number of experiments that follow from that point, it's like zoom straight line up to the point where today we have tens and tens of thousands of um, pieces of data information that we can use to understand what's the psychological connection between self creativity and our surroundings and i've been able to uh, and really was the objective or one of the main objectives of this book was to kind of pull this together because you know you, there's a there's an article over here and there's a post over there and some of it makes it into the general press where folks like you and I, non-scientists, can kind of uh, read into it, but a lot of it kind of remains buried within the scientific community. So I was very conscious about trying to unearth it all, or as much as I could find, synthesize it in some coherent way, and then make it accessible, not only to my fellow design and building professionals, but to folks interested in creativity and innovation, whether as a personal pastime, a pleasurable thing that we do, or for professional reasons, or in many cases for both. So you tell us also, while Guilford kind of set the groundwork in motion, one of the people who picked up on that was E.P. Torrance, and he brought us the famous Torrance tests. Right. So, um, well, there's a couple of aspects here. I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, two, what I think are sometimes called cognitive styles or modes of mental processing. We can call them uh, analytic and creative. We can call them left brain, right brain and kind of everyday thinking. But the basic idea that Guilford in the 1950 uh, uh, keynote, but even more in works he, he wrote after, books he wrote after, identified these kind of two modes of mental processing as our fundamental ways of thinking and that we tend to oscillate uh, between them depending on what we're doing, what we need to be doing. Uh, and Guilford, uh, excuse me, and Torrens picks up on this and creates uh, what are known as the Torrens test for creativity, because here's one of the big things, obviously, I had to deal with in the book, which is to say, how do you measure creativity? How can we talk about improvements in creative task performance if we can't measure it? And Torrens uh, is best known for developing these assessment tests, which quantify our creative output. So we're not just kind of touchy feely, how does it feel? Is this better? Is this worse? But in ways that's subjected to some reasonably objective criteria. He started off with, I think, four criteria in particular in the years. Now this is since the 1960s. I think it's mushroomed to maybe 16 different criteria where experts can take a body of work that is produced in the course of these assessment tests and evaluate them reasonably objectively and say, okay, this is more creative subjects over here, less creative subjects over there. Therefore, we can start to create some findings based on this data as to which environmental conditions improve creativity and which perhaps do not. So Torrance is a very important factor in this whole story of how do we improve our creativity in measurable ways. And another key figure in all this was a guy called Jonas Salk. I'd love if you'd share that because this also gives context of let's start making things happen out of this of architecture and our environments. Yeah, so everybody knows Jonas Salk as the, one of the primary inventors of the polio vaccine. Uh, in a lot of ways, polio was the COVID of its day. It was a scourge. It affected millions of people, uh, could create debilitating uh, diseases, deformities, obviously FDR, Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt is the best known example, someone who was stricken by polio as a young man and was crippled for the rest of his life. So it was a real, real health crisis in its day. 
So a young Jonas Salk is uh, hired by, I think it was the University of Pits uh, Pittsburgh, I believe. And uh, he shows up, he's a junior faculty member. So he gets stuck in this kind of crappy office down in the basement. <laughs> you know, you can just imagine dark, no view, kind of dank, whatever. Anyway, he gets to work. He's the junior faculty guy. So I guess he doesn't get to complain <laughs> about his office. And he's working for year after year and he's making a certain amount of progress. But at a certain point, he hits this like brick wall. And he just says, I'm, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm spinning wheels. I got to take a break. So he departs for a vacation. He chooses, for whatever reason, Assisi, Italy, which if folks know this town, and you can certainly Google pictures of it, it's a beautiful Italian. I mean, it's like a classic Italian hillside town that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Beautiful stone structures, churches. It's perched up on an elevation. It's just a gorgeous environment. And of course, the surrounding countryside as well. And in the course of being there and spending time there, his brain relaxes. He becomes much less stressed. And suddenly, some solutions to the problems he's working on back at the laboratory begin to bubble into consciousness. So he hurries back to his uh, office and then works through until he finally uh, discovers the cure to polio. And ever since that experience, he was convinced that his physical surroundings had a huge impact on his ability to break through his problem, to come up with a creative solution to what he was facing. And he proceeds, as he becomes obviously more famous, to found the Salk Institute. And he hires a very famous architect of his time. This is now the early 1960s. His name is Louis Kahn uh, to design the famous Salk Institute in La Jolla. California, which is still there and is open, by the way, to folks. If you want to visit, if you're ever there, I, I certainly recommend it, a guided tour through there. And the whole impetus behind this institute was to use architecture, but place, landscape, the surrounding uh, beautiful California um, uh, vistas that you get over the water to stimulate the fellows, the people who come to the institute to do their work, both scientists and uh, humanities um, folks. And one just a pure example of this, he specifically had Khan design the interior so there would be no columns, there would be no uh, structural supports kind of breaking up the space. So the space was completely open from one end of the building to the, to the other, from one side to the next, with the idea that the more open the space is, the more the people inside Side would collaborate with each other, would exchange ideas and more creative uh, things would come out of results. So he's a classic example of the idea that space matters. You mentioned also a 1984 paper on environmental psychology that was in a way a forerunner for books like yours and groundbreaking in your field. So in 1984, a young, at the time, a medical biologist named Roger S. Ulrich, uh, he's at the University of Delaware, um, although he was trained as a medical biologist, his real interest was in the relationship between healthcare facilities and patient outcomes. So based on a childhood experience he had, he uh, develops this hypothesis he wants to test. He travels uh, to a town about an hour west of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania called Paoli, Pennsylvania, where there was and still is a very sizable hospital institution. And he proceeds to undertake this experiment. What he basically does is he zooms in on one particular wing of the hospital where there is, let's say, a central corridor running down the wing. And there's a whole series of patient rooms uh, on one side of the corridor. And let's say they're all identical in terms of their layout and their, you know, what's going on inside in terms of their physical elements. So everybody is in these rooms. Everybody's looking out uh, in the same direction through their window. They're all actually people who are there for exactly the same surgical procedure. So right, you know, with, with, with scientific experimentation, your subject pool, you want it to be as homogenous as possible, right? Because you don't want individual idiosyncrasies to kind of skew the results. So he's, he's laying down all of these criteria. All of his subjects had to be in this wing, they had to be on the second and third floors of this wing for a reason I'll explain in a moment. They all had to have been there for the exact same surgical procedure. They all had to have been there within a very defined time period. So he is really narrowing down the variables. There was one and only one really significant difference in their environment. And that was what they saw through their windows as they're lying in bed for the several day stay uh, during their um, hospital visit. Roughly half the group that he studied when they looked out, they looked straight into the canopies of trees that had been planted in a courtyard just outside the wing, right? That's why the second and third floor is significant because they're elevated so they can see right into the leaves, the greenery. The other half, let's say the group farther down the corridor, when they looked out, they actually had a clear shot 
across the courtyard because the trees had only been planted to one end for whatever reason. And this second group looked onto a blank brick wall of another part of the wing, you know, X feet away from where they lay. So what Ulrich wanted to know was, was there any difference in patient outcomes based on what they saw through the window? So he's, you know, pulling his records, he's collating his data, he's crunching his numbers and Lo and behold, he finds not one, but several very striking differences between these two groups. Those that looked out onto the trees had shorter hospital stays, required less medication, and exhibited fewer complications than those who looked out on the blank brick wall. So let that sink in for a moment. We are talking about something in the environment, right? By definition, outside the human body, nonetheless, literally altering the core physiology of those bodies, literally altering our being at the level of life and death, right? So the power of the environment, something outside the body to influence how we think, feel, and act, it, it can't get any more powerful than that. So that really opens the door to uh, a whole series of very significant changes in the healthcare industry, in the design and building industry that caters to that market. And it eventually morphs into something called evidence-based design, EBD for short. So what evidence-based design says is, look, in addition to the traditional criteria by which we, and that's everybody who has any kind of role in shaping, whether it's their home environment or the built world outside, and these traditional criteria are things like, you know, our aesthetic preferences or our budget or technology or context or whatever. In addition to all those criteria on which we base our decisions on what we want our surroundings to be, we should add one more, which is what does science tell us will be the outcome of those decisions? Because at the end of the day, it's really all about that, right? It's not just, oh, that's a pretty thing or this holds my papers. It's what kind of effect does it have reciprocally on us as people in terms of how we think, feel, and act. So a really groundbreaking experiment that is still being felt, uh, the effects are still being felt today. Maybe before we go into how we can actually manipulate the, organ the, the environment for the organism, Let's talk about priming because some just to make sure everybody's up to speed on what that actually is. So the phenomenon that uh, seemed to be in effect in Ulrich's experiment is known as brain priming. So a prime generally consists of, let's say, three elements. First of all, there's an input. That means some kind of stimulus entering human consciousness through one of the five senses, the main senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch where it then triggers some kind of output, some kind of change of condition, change of behavior. So in the context of Ulrich's experiment that I just described, the input would have been the view through the window and the output would have been an improvement in human wellness in patient outcomes. And uh, in the course of my book, what I'm really dealing with is a kind of special subcategory of brain primes, which I call design triggers. And I'm using the word design there, not so much in its sort of artistic aesthetic sense, but uh, in the way we use it when we say, oh, I did something by design, meaning intentionally, deliberately, because once we have this information, these findings, these correlations between input and output, we can, as you say, very deliberately by design, apply them to our own physical environment, not necessarily to improve human wellness. Although interestingly, as we can talk about, there is an absolute connection between inputs that improve creativity and improve health. And while I'm at it, throw in happiness as well. But we can very specifically also measure for improvements in human creativity. So a kind of second body of findings, right? There's, there's Ulrich's kind of health patient oriented outcome findings is why don't we just do all of these experiments again, only this time measure for improvements in human creativity, human create, uh, creative task performance. So it's like we went back all the way. What do we see out the window? What kind of colors? What's the shape of our furnishings, of our surroundings? All of these different inputs that had been studied for improvement in human wellness are now being measured specifically. And go back to Torrance. We have these ways of measuring creativity um, to see what, if we can find these positive connections between our surroundings and that desired output improved creative test performance. So you mentioned the treetop experiment, but I loved the one before we get into some of the tactics of literally thinking outside the box. 
<laughs> yeah, so we all know that expression. We, we use it to describe people who kind of think unconventionally, um, go beyond the kind of uh, uh, conventional wisdom uh, parameters. So there was an interesting experiment where, you know, and this is how they typically will set up. You'll have at least two groups, right? Group A of subjects, group B of subjects. And you try to make their environment exactly the same except for one condition. But then you also put them through the same creative problem solving exercise is um, absolutely the same from one group to the next so that they're doing the same kind of solving the same kind of problem. So in this particular case, it's almost funny in a way, uh, if you can picture it, they put the first group inside a I guess cardboard carton, right? Just big enough so you can kind of sit down in it with your probably legs are up and they gave them their, their problems to solve and they're working at them. And then when they were done, they got to come out of the box. The box is open above. So they're just kind of sitting in it with the four walls, I guess, around them in the cardboard bottom. Then they took a second group, you know, these people went away and they brought in a second group and they had them sitting next to the box, literally just outside the box. And they gave them their creativity assessment test and they did their thing. The data comes in and what do they find? The people who sat outside the box did better, outperformed the group that sat inside the box. So here you see a kind of powerful metaphor, right? Because I mean, other sitting in a box, what's the big diff here? A, a powerful metaphor influencing how they processed information, how they saw the world. They were more open to new ideas, new solutions, creative ways of attacking the problem. And the people who are constrained by the physical space as minor that, uh, that constraint was by vis-a-vis -vis the size of the cardboard carton. But this is just an example of how super attuned we are to our environment and to literally change how we think. And I love the way you tee up the book here. I'm going to quote one of my favorite quotes from the book was this one. You said, a creative idea is not a disembodied thought bubble born and bred in our brains, but the result of an intricate interplay of mind, body and place. Beautifully said and a great way to get into the tactics. Just for our audience, the way Donald tees up every one of the tactics and there's 48 of them and then there's explainers as well and they interplay with each other as well. It's magnificently done. You start with a succinct description of what the tactic is, then you cite the primary research, and then you go into deeper research w about each of them. I think it's important because I'm sure you gave a hell of a lot of thought to that yourself, you had to create some type of mental model to get all this information into the book. So bravo to you and, and well done. And with that, let's start with tactic one, what it is, it's des designating a creative space. Thank you for that, um, Aiden. And I would also add one more component to each uh, technique, which is how to do it, right? So I'm, I'm getting into the theory, I'm getting into the science, I'm getting the ideas, but I also want to show people here's, here's literally some ways you can implement these tactics in very how-to kind of uh, uh, advice. Um, so designated creative space, each one of these techniques, by the way, I have this kind of just short you know, name I give them to kind of summarize what they're about. That's um, kind of a straightforward idea, which is, you know, try to do your creative work in the same place at the same time, by the way, as much as is possible. Right. So that seems kind of, you know, straightforward and practical because then you have all your kind of stuff and your equipment, but it gets a little gets a little deeper than that, which is think about, of course, the classic uh, Pavlovian experiment where he has the dogs being fed at the same time every day and he rings the bell at the same time that he's feeding them to the point where he doesn't even have to put out the food. He just rings the bell and the dogs come running and start salivating. That is known as classical conditioning because our brain is making a straight or their brain is making a straight association between input and outcome, right? The bell food, the bell food, and it gets uh, etched into their neural pathways. Well, the same thing happens to us. Whereas if we do the same thing in the same place day in and day out, our brains will automatically kick into a kind of creative mindset just by entering into that space because we've become, we've become classically conditioned to associate that space with a certain mental mindset. So you don't have to invest a lot of energy to kind of task switch or to get into that mental mode of processing. You're in the same place at the same time, hopefully doing the same thing again and again. It'll just raise your kind of performance level that much more. One of the great examples you give is author and artist Austin Cleon and how he has designated space within his working area. I thought this was fascinating because again, you want those primes going back to that word again to prime you for what you're doing in that space, in that space, in that space. I thought this was really important, particularly 
in this time of the pandemic where we're actually where everything's coming together and that's not so helpful but we can do very small things to make very big impact Austin is a, is a good example of kind of an almost an ideal uh, scenario, which uh, being ideal is uh, sometimes difficult to attain. But he, I think, works out of his garage, you know, classic American uh, creative space. And by the way, Austin Kleon, he's a, I guess he's an author, but also an artist, illustrator and so forth. So he has literally uh, different setups depending on what he's doing. He's got his kind of creative setup. Then he's got his sort of anal analog setup, more analytical setup, I should say. And then he's got kind of his drawing and, and illustration set up. And he just has to swivel around because he's kind of got it arranged in his space so he can literally have a different, and these are micro environments in essence, right? It's not like he has to leave the building and go across town to another place just by shifting his work surface, what's he seeing, what's he uh, uh, adjacent to, he can kind of shift mental mental tasks as well. Now that's tough for folks who maybe live in an apartment like I did for many years in New York City where space is tight, but you can do very subtle things. You can literally, you know, bring out a certain uh, photograph or desk plant or object and place it on your desk when you're in a sort of a creative mode. And just, just that one connection is enough to connect place and time and task, you don't have to completely change your environment. But of course, the more you can kind of shift around to different setups, also on a more practical level, the more fluid your thinking will be. Having said that, I do recommend folks try to stay on task for as sustained a period of time as possible because mental task switching actually consumes a lot of neuro energy in a sense to kind of switch from an analytical to a creative and back again. So try to stick with whatever you're trying to do to either bring it to a conclusion or at a certain uh, time period, switch over to another sustained undertaking. But space connection, big, small, whatever you can do to associate space with mental task, uh, mental uh, cognitive style, uh, the better it will be. And one of the simple, simple examples you gave, which is a great one was, I love this, having separate logins on your computer, as we all can do, so we can have profiles on our computer. And one's a personal one, and one's a professional one. So you can where whichever one you're going to focus in, say, for example, you're writing your blog, you can just go into your personal one. And then for the professional one, you can have your Excel and your PowerPoint or whatever you have in there. Exactly, exactly. And you know, this is a this is, of course, one of the big challenges of folks who have been kind of thrust into a work from home situation without a lot of notice, um, and ability to shape their environment, um, to kind of uh, adapt to that new reality, um, which is yeah, try to create boundaries, even if again, you don't have walls up between you and your living space between your workspace and your living space, try to create some elements of boundaries, whether material or psychological because it is important for our brains to know when we're in kind of work mode and when we're in kind of personal mode and not to blur the two to the point where you're switching back and forth between them willy nilly and doing things as simple as yes, having different logins to kind of create these boundaries will help your just kind of mental well being, your your performance and so forth. Also things like what you wear, right? I mean, uh, you know, there's a temptation of course when working from home to to wear your Zoom pajamas, which is a nice shirt, but you know, your jammies <laughs> down below and your slippers. I would sort of caution against that. I would suggest no, wear what you would have worn had you gone to the office when you're in work mode and change your clothes five or six or whatever it is you normally would because it's sending a signal to your brain. Uh, I'm out of work mode now. I'm in a kind of different state of being. All those subtle cues your brains will will will, will pick up on uh, even if you don't think that they would. So I found that one fascinating because I remember as a kid, I used to wear, you know, the way in schools you can wear a blazer or just a jumper. I used to wear the full you know, metal jacket, wear the whole blazer, everything. And it was for exactly that reason, it felt like I was switching on. And it's one of the things you miss in the in the pandemic at the moment is like, I used to have a great routine of gym, you know, breakfast, go into work to write for an hour before work even started. And I miss those little cues, because when you're in your home office, you have to actually try and find new ones and recalibrate everything. But I found that one really, really useful. Let's move into the next one, which is absolutely fascinating which none of us can make an excuse for. Tactic two is find something blue. So color, of course, is one of the most ubiquitous factors in our surroundings. I mean, we can't, we can't escape it, not that we would want to. 
Um, so in, I believe it was 2009, a couple of researchers from the University of British Columbia wanted to know, does color influence our ability to think creatively? And very rapidly, they very wisely, they kind of narrowed down the scope of the research. Color is a pretty big uh, topic, obviously, to, to study just two of the primaries, red and blue. And so here, what they did, they were very clever. These, these researchers are typically very clever because one of the things they have to do is to hide from the subjects what they're really up to. Because the moment you tell a subject in a scientific experiment, here's what I'm trying to do, you kick in what's called the Hawthorne effect, which is where people become self-conscious about what they're doing. And obviously the results start skewing all over the place. So they're always kind of tricking people a little. And what they did here was they, and now we're in the computer area, uh, computer era, of course, a lot of these Torrens tests are administered through uh, computers. They put up their testing material on screen, if you can imagine, but then they inset it, right? So they left this border around the material that they had people working on. And then they colorize the background. So there would be the red group, right? So you have your testing material and they would see this thick band of red and second group saw a thick band of blue. And then there was a third group which saw white. What is white? White is the absence of color. So they're taking color out of the equation. The white group becomes the datum, right? The baseline on which they can measure the performance of the red and blue group and, and be eight, reasonably able to attribute any differences between the red and blue group and the white to the presence of one or the other color, right? So that's how science has to work. You have to isolate one variable in an environment to see what its effect might be. Long story short, the blue group turns out to have outperformed the red group on the creativity test. But here's an interesting part. The red group did better than the blue group on the analytical test, right? Because they're actually measuring both, not just creative thinking. So thinking of left brain and right brain as sort of uh, antitheses on some level, sort of opposites. If you're in a more uh, red environment, you're going to be better at your Excel spreadsheets. That's a good time to kind of go over your profit and loss reports and things like that. But if you're trying to brainstorm a new product, you would ideally be primed with blue. Okay, so this is all good information. But what I try to do in the book always is to kind of ask the question, why? Well, okay, you know, what, why, why would blue make people think better in creative um, tasks, whereas analytics seems to do better for us in analytic, uh, red do better for us in analytical ones. So the minute you, the minute you ask the question, why in the kind of material that I'm dealing with in the book, of course, we are immediately having to enter into the realm of theory. We cannot uh, prove why people respond the way they do with the same kind of logical certainty. We can prove that two plus two equals four, right? But uh, think of it almost like um, attorneys. If scientists were attorneys, what do they do? They, they amass their evidence. They form a coherent narrative based on that evidence. They pitch their narrative to the judge or the jury, or in the case of the scientific community, obviously, to their fellow scientists or the broader marketplace of ideas. And they see, you know, which which theories fly and which don't. So there's a usually there's more than one idea as to why we are responding the way they do, and they're not even necessarily mutually exclusive. Very often they're complementary because people are complicated. We're multi-layered beings. We don't just do fun things for one reason and one reason only. So lots of possible theories as to blue. The one I talk about in the book, the one that sort of appeals to me, maybe because I'm an architect and I think see things in very spatial terms is the fact that blue has a certain effect on how we perceive space. So imagine yourself going out into the countryside on a beautiful sunny day. Look into the distance, you see hills. What color are those hills typically? In most cases, they're gonna be kind of bluish cast. Whereas things in the foreground are gonna be warmer, more saturated colors. So what's going on there is known as atmospheric perspective. It has to do with how light rays are refracted, refracted through air. But the way our brains are wired, having to do with uh, short versus long wavelengths, things that are in cool colors, such as blue, appear optically to be farther away, whereas things that are rendered, the very same thing rendered in a warm, say, red color, appear to optically advance toward us. If you ever want to see this in uh, rendered in artistic terms, have a look at the Mona Lisa someday. You are the picture of one if you're not in uh, in Italy at the moment, you'll notice that the background behind her head, that deep space, that recessive space is painted in a very bluish cast, whereas her sleeves are red, her flesh, her hands in the foreground are very red. Those are elements closest to the viewer, closest to the picture plane. So Leonardo is using color to represent depth. My ultimate thesis is the more open, the more deep our perception of space is, the more, and think about how we use language, the more open-minded we are, open to new ideas, new ways of doing things, new ways of seeing the world, the more 
closed in, hemmed in, the more narrowly focused we are, which is not a bad thing if you're crunching numbers on an Excel spreadsheet because you are zooming in right on those numbers, you are analyzing them, you are thinking analytically. So color seems to impact our cognitive style to literally change how we think, blue being one of the creativity positive colors. There is a second one, maybe we'll get to later, but I'll hold off on that for now. There's a study you talk about, 2006, Shashi Khan, and this one was absolutely f fascinating. So it was the red and blue in the, in the rooms, in the environment, and to see how the organisms, the humans, interacted in the environment when it was red and when it was blue. Yeah, so Shashi Khan is a fellow architect, and she ran an interesting experiment uh, in my hometown, New York City. Uh, this was 2006. It was at the Architectural Digest show, which is a big trade show for the design and building industry. They hold it in this big pier, you know, cavernous space, and they've got all the booths and everything. But what she did was to set up a series of event tents. Um, so you can imagine, you know, cloth tents, nice uh, square uh, spaces. And then she colorized them. She went to great lengths to turn them into almost purely chromatic experiences. So she had a blue tent where the lighting was all blue, you know, like stage lighting, theater lighting. But she had people putting on white hazmat suits right over their clothes so that their color of their clothes wouldn't kind of jumble the the, the primes, wouldn't uh, render them less pure. She had uh, white computers sitting on white pedestals for people to play around with. Even the food was either white or clear. So she had absolutely, you know, purely prime uh, experience for uh, red, uh, excuse me, blue, and the second tent did the same thing only for red. And then she kind of, you know, went behind the curtain and watched how people behave. And what was fascinating is that they behave very differently in these two tents. They're just kind of hanging out and enjoying the hors d'oeuvres. They didn't know they were kind of being watched. I guess it's a little sneaky. Um, but the people in the blue tent, they tended to hug the perimeter, right? They moved out to the edges of the space and they tended to do so in like ones or twos. And to me, that's almost like that's embodying creative thinking because what are they doing? They're, they're testing boundaries, they're going to the limits and they're doing so individually or maybe with one other person, which is a lot of, which is how creativity generally occurs. It starts at kind of individual level or maybe two people kind of exchanging ideas. Whereas the people in the red tent, they tended to huddle en masse it towards the center of the space, almost like just what we're talking about. The red walls were pushing them in, even though it wasn't literally the case. And they did so in larger numbers. They were almost engaged in group think, right? Whereas, so they were kind of reinforcing each other and whatever they were saying and thinking. So it's just a fascinating embodiment, right? Behavior being influenced, not just the kind of wheels turning in our heads through the medium of color. Yeah, it's fascinating. It made me think of, you know, political parties of the past and certain colors that were chosen. I, when I, we used to wear a shirt and tie and work. I used to wear a red tie because I, I was told it's powerful tie. But uh, this made me think quite differently about it. And little things... I changed where my screensavers, for example, I, I changed blues and, you know, I started looking at where I could add more blue. Maybe we'll share a couple of little examples where people can do this around their life. There's lots of ways you can clearly apply this and one we've, we've touched on and you just touched on, which is to make your color background on your monitor one color or the other. Obviously, you can apply it to walls, but you can go much beyond that. We could have upholstery colors, you can have window treatments, even artwork, even just an object on your desk that's a blue. And obviously we don't have a pure, we don't do what Shashi Khan does. We don't have this purely <laughs> blue environment. What you wanna do is to use neutral colors, whites, beiges, grays, blacks, or natural finishes, woods, most typically stones, if you happen to live in that kind of a space to offset. But these are neutral colors, so they don't have that kind of impact. The blue kind of pops out as the prime as the prime that's going to affect your thinking most. So there's lots of ways to apply it to your environment. So what we're trying to do here is get lofty thinking and lofty goals, which brings us nicely to our next one, which is work under a lofty ceiling. So, you know, sometimes when I give some of these ideas as to why blue is in, impacting us the way it is, people go, yeah, that's, that's cool, that's interesting, but isn't there a more sort of direct way if you want to measure how open or closed the space is, just put people in a big room and run them through their tests and put them in a small room and run them through their tests. Uh, yes, that basic idea is true. It gets a little tricky when you start talking big and small and making sure all the variables are controlled, but here's the thing about space. It's not just front, back, left to right. It's also vertical. It's three-dimensional. So here's a purely you know, almost a pure example of manipulating a single environment to discover correlations. 
Uh, this was a 2007 experiment where they had, if you can visualize, a kind of small, uh, almost one person only little lab room in a university building. And they had a built in surface, they had a little laptop on it, the walls are the walls, nothing going on there. And the uh, first group came in and did their creativity and analytic uh, assessment tests under the as what's called the as built ceiling, meaning existing conditions, it would happen to be 10 feet above the floor. So this first group comes in and does all their thing, you know, one at a time, in and out, in and out, they get their data set. And then the researchers, tricky as they are, they come in and they lay in a false dropped ceiling, as it's sometimes called, at eight feet above the floor. It was made out of like white foam core, which is this material. And you know, when you go into an office building, a lot of times you see those acoustic tile ceilings. Those are drop ceilings. The actual structural ceiling is usually a few feet above. There's air conditioning and wiring going on in between. But they didn't tell people, hey, we just dropped the ceiling. They brought in a fresh group. They did their tests. And lo and behold, it's almost a mirror of the red-blue experiment. The people under the 10-foot ceiling did best on their creativity tests. Those under the 8-foot ceiling, the more closed-in space, did better on the analytical test. So here we have really concrete connection between openness, between spaciousness, and cognitive style. Yeah, and you mentioned in the introduction uh, design writer William Little, Little, and he dubbed this the cathedral effect, but you also gives us ways where we can actually mimic this in our homes. Yeah, so the, it's a wonderful term, but if you think about the great, you know, Gothic cathedrals of Europe, they are these extraordinarily tall interior spaces. And to me, what that's doing, among other things, is to kind of move the mind into a very abstract kind of mode, right? Because what are you trying to do within a great cathedral is to bring in thoughts of the divine. And that is the most abstract, kind of non-specific, big picture thinking you can do, which in a lot of ways is what creative thinking is, right? You don't start if you're developing a product by figuring out the details, you know, what kind of screws should we use? No, you started with the big picture. What am I trying to accomplish? And you funnel in more and more until you get to the level of detail where you have to worry about what type of screw uh, to use. And so creative thinking starts with this kind of open, abstract, non-specific sense, whereas analytical thinking tends to be more narrow and focused. Um, but, you know, we, we don't live in cathedrals and many of us aren't able to just suddenly raise our ceilings up to 10 feet just because we want to. Um, so there are tricks. And here's the thing about a lot of these primes. It's not so much about what the literal condition is, but what our brains think the condition is, right? So if you don't have 10 foot ceilings, well, you can still enhance the verticality of your space by doing things like paint stripes or put um, wall coverings that have vertical stripes as a pattern because what that's going to do is to kind of lead the eye vertically. It's going to emphasize the vertical dimension whereas if you put in like a, what's called a chair rail, a molding that's very horizontal in nature, it's going to tend to create a more set lower sense of the space. So there's lots of ways you can manipulate furnishings. You could lean a mirror up against a wall, a very tall mirror and have it bounce uh, the view of the ceiling inside the mirror, which makes the whole room look bigger and taller, all sorts of tricks of the trade to make your brain think space is open. So we're not talking about having a 1500 square foot home office. That's not what we literally mean. It's just your sense, is the space open or I feel closed in? Of course, having an opening in your, in your workspace is one of the best ways to really amplify that sense of openness and to relieve the, the sense of being enclosed within the walls. And you don't have to be looking out of it. It just needs to be kind of in your peripheral vision or even something you can kind of turn your head to at periodic times in the course of your work session because that's good to kind of take in the outdoors, give your brain a break, take a micro grow break it can be just a minute or two but that sense of openness uh, is just going to put you in the right frame of mind as you turn back to your test speaking of openness you you start the next one with a beautiful quote by thomas dewar and he said minds are like parachutes they only function when open and he used this as a way to tee us up for having art in our environment and how that impacts us I love that quote because it just, you know, it drives home the point in very vivid terms. Yes, open-mindedness is key, as I said earlier. You, you, what you, what you want to avoid is what the sort of experts call premature closure, right? Because if you're banding about ideas in a brainstorming session or even just uh, for yourself, if you're just saying, you know, naysaying early on, you're going to kind of limit your ability to break outside the wall, to think outside the box, as we're saying. 
Um, so one of the ways you can kind of prime that sense is by hanging artwork. This is another good example of how through sometimes inexpensive means. We could be talking about a vintage travel poster, for example, from the 1920s. There are wonderful reproductions of them. This artwork, just by hanging on the wall, can do a lot for your uh, cognitive style. So for example, if it shows a landscape, a rendering of a deep landscape and says, come to you know, the Italian Riviera and it shows this beautiful uh, picture of the rolling countryside receding in the depth, there's that priming going on again, where I see spaciousness distancing effect. Uh, artwork also induces what's called saccadic eye movement, right? We know what that is. That's where our eyes kind of dart from the left and the right, then up and down. Well, when you look at a work of art, your eye is generally moving all over the canvas or the print or whatever it is. That is good for your kind of mental performance because it's activating neural pathways through both sides of your brain, right? So when you look left, uh, what they find is the right hemisphere of the brain gets activated. When you look right, the left brain of the hemisphere gets activated. So when you're looking back and forth, you're enforcing or reinforcing connections between the two halves. Now, here's the thing. The term creativity has kind of two connotations. The one I focus on in the book is the, what I call the sort of idea generative phase, right, of creativity, which is where you kind of brainstorming. You're coming up with new ideas. But creativity also has a sort of holistic uh, connotation, which is, all right, great, you have all these, you know, wonderful ideas, but uh, do they work, right? Because you may have a great idea for a product, but if you can't uh, realize it in, in terms of production, if you can't get it to sell in the marketplace, that idea is kind of worthless. So there's a second phase of the creative process, which actually involves, guess what, analytical thinking. That's where you verify and validate your creative ideas to make sure they work. So it's important that you're actually a good thinker on both sides of your brain, which is why looking back and forth is a great way to strengthen both sides of our personalities and classic, fantastic um, uh, finding um, to mention Albert Einstein, of course, uh, you know, the famous, his brain gets put into a what, canister or a test tube or something after he dies. Anyway, just recently they analyzed the brain again. And then what they found is that the element that bridges the two halves of the brain called the corpus callosum, his was unusually large. And it makes perfect sense when you think about him because he is the consummate thinker in that he was able to be very analytic, obviously, but he was extraordinarily creative too. And the fact that these two halves were kind of connected so well by moving in part, eyes around is a great way to kind of strengthen one's own capabilities. Beautiful. And I suppose, you know, one of the things I got even from art was that it's the mental models that it evokes. And oftentimes, you know, I, I, I write a weekly article and oftentimes it's an image that sparks the thinking. And sometimes if you can find those models or you can find those kind of pictures that, that evoke what you want to say, it can be so liberating. It's, it's a lovely experience actually when it happens, which leads me nicely to the next one because you mentioned priming earlier on and objects prime us absolutely, including objects from our past. And this next one is about thinking back for old mementos, nostalgic reveries from the past that they can evoke things into the future. And the minimalists out there will not like me for saying this, but having them around you can evoke creativity as well. Yeah, and you know, uh, what's also interesting is a lot of primes we're talking about do kind of uh, hold together under the theme of distancing. So distance isn't just about feet and inches. Um, it is also can be expressed in temporal uh, units, time. So they did an experiment where they had group A come in and they asked them to all to think back to a distant uh, event in their own past for a minute or two prior to taking their creativity assessment tests. Okay, they do their thing. They bring in a second group and they just give them the creativity test. They don't have them think back. Once more, we find that the group that was primed with the idea of spaciousness of distance, in this case, time, outperformed the group that uh, was not so primed. So what seems to be happening is that our minds open up once again, just by connecting points in time farther apart, as opposed to more near parts. And, you know, it does make a certain amount of sense because as time goes on, our recollection of details, they tend to get a little fuzzier, right? Try to remember something you did 10 years ago. Uh, it's much less specific, much less detailed, much less narrowly focused, analytical-like, where it becomes more big picture, more creative-like. So, yep, just by putting on old family 
photos or your, you know, souvenir from high school, your trophy that you won in such and such a sport or what have you. Can, and just looking at it for a second as you're trying to kind of brainstorm can actually prime creative thinking because of that sense of temporal distancing. And this kind of sparks me to think about one of the explainers. I mentioned that you have several explainers throughout the book, but you have one on space, time and creativity and CLT, which I'll let you explain in a second. But I was telling you before the show, I usually have a copy of the author's book behind me. And I have a physical copy of your book, but I also have it in my Kindle. And my sons loved it because of the imagery in it. And one in particular, last night, my seven year old son, I went into his room and he was looking at the image where you show the image of a field with a tractor in it, and where I'm actually standing in the field, essentially, and then you show the overhead image and how different it is, which also thinking that way, even without actually seeing those images has an immense impact on our creativity. Yeah, so um, construal level theory, you know, with all of this talk that we're, we're having this conversation that seems to tie into distancing effects, you would think that somebody in the scientific community would have come up with some kind of theory to kind of knit this all together, make this some kind of sense out of it. And they have. Um, this is called construal level theory. Not my favorite uh, terminology. It's a little awkward. But what that basically says is the farther away we construe some piece of information, an object event, the more, just as I was talking about, the more abstract, nonspecific, what they call higher level construal, our brains seem to uh, shift into. The closer we come to something, the more detailed, focused, uh, specific it becomes. So the image I give in the book and that I use in my talks is picture yourself in an airplane, you're flying over farm country, wherever you happen to live, you look down at 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, wherever you happen to be at, what does it look like to you? It looks like an abstract painting, right? Something you would see hanging in a museum that an abstract artist would have rendered as just broad fields of color and light and shade. You can't quite, you know, figure out what you're looking at down there on the ground. You have some general sense but if someone asked you, you know, what do they grow? What's that crop you're looking at down there? You would have no idea because there isn't enough information entering the brain from such a distance to make any kind of judgments like that. And so there's that creative big picture mindset. Let's start off with the broad brush view of the, of the world or our problem. Whereas if you were to parachute down, you know, right down below, what are you looking at? Well, you can see the tractor. It says John Deere. You can see every scratch on it, every screw and bolt and nut. You can see now they're, oh, they're, they're growing wheat here. So we come literally more focused, more narrow, just the different levels of information coming into our brain will shift us to one uh, cognitive style or the other. So control level theory. And by the way, um, it also evinces itself in different media. Um, we touched on, uh, for example, dress. So they have uh, something called social distancing. All right, so that's the meme of the moment, of course. But in a lot of ways, if anybody is asking me, <laughs> social distancing as we're currently using it is a bit of a misnomer because we're not really saying don't socialize. We're just saying keep a certain distance. When we socialize, spatial distancing would have been better, but I think that train has left the station. Um, but social distancing as a psychological concept actually goes back a good 10 plus years. And the idea is that our dress signals uh, to other people where we stand in a kind of social hierarchy. So if you see somebody in a hospital, for example, coming down the hall and they're wearing a white lab coat and they got stethoscope around the neck, that person has a more elevated status on a social level to you or me, you or me, yes, um, because we're not doctors and they're in their milieu. So there's a kind of distancing effect or even onto your own sense of self, right? If you get dressed up in a black tie or long gown or whatever it is, you're going out to a big fundraiser, you get that sort of elevated sense above your everyday sort of quotidian self when you're kind of kicking back in jeans and a t-shirt. And so this distancing effect, that priming effect kicks in one more time and into one cognitive style or the other, depending on our sense of social stuff, self or social uh, status. So construal level theory kind of encompasses all of these different things, space, time, and dress. I was trying to think about how to enact this, I suppose. And one of the ways so say you're working on a strategy, or you're working on some type of paper, what what is it a mental thing that we in, in, enact here? How do we actually do that? It create that kind of distance where, you know, I'm the way I kind of think about it is, I'm on the dance floor, but I want to get up onto the balcony looking down onto the dance floor. A simple techniques is if you are fortunate to have that window that looks out into the distance, just literally turn your eyes uh, outward. If you have artwork that represents distancing, turn it outward, 
do what they did in that experiment. Just think back to uh, an important event in your life, but 10 years ago and think about it for a while, you'll kind of shift into that mindset. So you don't, you know, have to go up in an airplane to do this, but just as, and you know, a lot of interesting thing about a lot of these priming experiments is like the time that they're talking about in many cases is quite, can be quite small, literally seconds in some cases where they'll flash something on a screen and then they'll have people going into their assessment test. That little prime, it was there for two seconds, three seconds, even less in some cases. So the brain is very fast in processing these primes. You don't have to spend a long time to kind of shift into that mode. Uh, and all it can take is a, is a different, you know, visual field in some cases. Or, you know, and by the way, we, we do get about 80% of our information through eye, through sight, through that particular sense. But think about the other senses as well, smell, sounds, all of these things can actually affect us as well. So if you listen to classical music, for example, that in a sense primes that temporal distancing effect because you, of course, immediately become aware that this is uh, music from the past. Let's bring it into the organization now. So obviously, when we're when we're back, out of, back in the wild, one of the things that many of us will have in our in our mindsets is the idea of the boardroom table. And it's a big, long, rectangular table that looks like it goes on for miles and miles. But you mentioned the next tactic, it's one of your favorites in the book. And it's about gathering in a circle. And there's a reason humans gathered in a circle going back to 200,000 years ago in the caves, because it created a more social environment, a more collaborative environment. And you bring this tactic to life with a story of Ed Catmull from Pixar. Right. So Ed Catmull's uh, book opens with uh, a wonderful story about how uh, their, their team at Pixar would meet in this room and there was this beautiful rectangular table that had been picked out by no less than Steve Jobs himself from his favorite uh, work of his favorite designer. But Catmull kind of goes on and on about how they were just finding it really hard uh, taxing to come up with creative ideas for their various products. And it took him 12 years, but he kind of figured out it's this table, it's not helping us. And when you think about it, there's a, there's a lot of good reasons why these tables are actually not as conducive to creative uh, group collaborations as you would hope. First of all, what happens a lot, of course, is that certain person of authority, where are they sitting? They're sitting down at the head of the table, right? Um, and you know they're there by virtue of their status within the organization. Uh, so what happens in a brainstorming session? Let's say the person down at the table throws out an idea. Well, you know, what's, what, what's likely to occur is that the people around the table who report to this individual are going to generally receive that idea on a pretty favorable basis, right? It's just kind of human nature. We have to defer to authority or we actually are biased to defer to authority because that's how we kind of survived. Um, but if you take that very same idea and let's say you have it come out of the mouth of someone sitting way back in the corner there, maybe that's the, the junior or the introvert or the newbie to the organization, will that same idea be received the very same way by the people around the table? very, very unlikely just because of this what's called psychosocial condition, right? Where uh, the, the, depending on who has the idea, people react differently to it. And that's not what you want in an innovative organization, right? You want that idea to be evaluated on the basis of its merits, not on who has them. There are also some logistical problems or some physical problems. Uh, you know how hard it is if you're sitting in a corner and you want to talk to the person in the same side as you, but at the opposite corner, you know, you have to, <laughs> like, you have to, like, lean over, you turn your neck almost to the point where it snaps. Uh, you get your, you know, you make your comment to that person or whatever in the minute you're finished, you want to like pull back and get comfortable again. So what does this mean? It means that the flow of conversation is not equal around the table. You're going to talk to people across from you, next to you, much more than you will talk to that person in the opposite corner. And there again, it's running counter to the idea of a creative brainstorming session. You want the ideas to flow as much as possible. And this isn't just speculation. They've actually done studies of jury room tables, which are typically these rectangular tables, and they've mapped how much uh, people talk to each other. And they have found just what I said. It's an uneven distribution of conversation. So this is real world problem here. So, okay, how do we solve this problem? Well, think about chucking that table, that $12,000 table that Steve Jobs paid for at Pixar and replacing it with, let's say, a circular one, a round one. So look what happens now. Gone 
in a poof is that hierarchically privileged position down at the end of the table because everybody is sitting around a curve. We're all equidistant to the center of the table. That center of the table becomes like a, an idea basket into which everybody is entitled to kind of toss out their thoughts and they have them evaluated. Um, everybody can see each other. Even just the person next to you by angling slightly picks, comes into your peripheral field of vision. Eye contact, super important and making connections amongst people in the group. All of these differences come about and you will find that uh, your kind of creative output is just going to improve just by changing how people are arranged relative to each other. I heard a great tip before when I worked in a very corporate organization. And if you were going to have an awkward conversation at in the board or at the board table or with a big audience of people, sit next to the person you're going to argue with. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very hard to argue with somebody who's sitting right beside you, like literally. And uh, I often think of, I often had this visual of a Tyrannosaurus trying to have a fight with the little arms, trying to fight with the person beside it. It's impossible to do. But um, you talked about um, uh, the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond as well, because this has a major impact in schools and asylums and mental hospitals, all this kind of thing. I'd love if you'd share this because I'm, I've, a, I've, I've, I've a personal uh, preference for all the research as well. I loved the research and the depth to which you went to with your own research. Humphrey Osmond is a fascinating character. Um, he kind of figures into cultural history and science in lots of interesting ways. Uh, for one thing, he happened to be the inventor of the term psychedelic. <laughs> um, and he was actually an early proponent of using hallucinogens for sort of positive ends. Um, but in terms of um, my creative space, the book, the research we're talking about, he's particularly important because he really sets up what's uh, called the psychosocial dimension of space, which is how do our relationships, how we uh, configure ourselves relative to each other in space affect our interpersonal exchanges. So he coins two terms in particular uh, that are very important that apply to just what we're talking about. One is called socio-fugal space and the other is called socio-petal space. So socio-petal space, this is a mashup obviously of two words, social and centripetal. So tripetal, what means outward force or force directed towards the periphery of something. Uh, we typically use it in terms of, you know, it's universal space, but think about in terms of that table uh, that we just described, that rectangular table. Where's all the focus? All the energy is on that person at the end of the table. Everybody's eyes are literally turned there uh, as the meeting is um, going on. So that's an example of some tripetal space moving to its perimeter of this arrangement of people, whereas centrifugal excuse me, sociofugal space is an inward radial focused uh, arrangement of people such as we described in the case of the circular table where the focus is on the space uh, at the center. And you know, this doesn't apply just to tables. Even if you have a, uh, let's say a living room seating arrangement at home and you have a sofa and right straight across or two, let's say easy chairs and everything is kind of on the grid. Um, that's one kind of arrangement. But if you took those easy chairs, that's more of a, a socio, uh, sociopedal space, but if you took those chairs and just kind of tweaked them a few degrees apart, suddenly you have a, actually a radial space where everybody can kind of see each other. It's not a kind of confrontational arrangement and the conversation could actually flow more readily in that kind of a configuration. And when you look around uh, different environments, you see, you can start to analyze each one. Is this a sociofugal space or is this a sociopedal space? So if those, if you're going on a, an airplane uh, ride or a trip on an airplane, you're sitting outside your gate and you notice all of those seats are in rows, of course. That's a gridded array, a gridded arrangement of people because you know what? Nobody talks to each other that aren't part of the same party. Um, it's, it, the idea is there, people tend to become more individualistic, more uh, sort of unique or a sense of uniqueness unto themselves. Whereas socio, I have to keep remembering, socio pedal <laughs> space, that square table or that round space, we tend to become more collaborative. We tend to think of ourselves as part of a group. And that's, you know, in a restaurant, for example, where there are round tables that you would see in different, uh, a different condition. Go into a house of worship, all the pews are in rows. Now, I want to say like this is a qualitative assessment, by the way, there are times where a gridded array is the right thing to do when you're having a top down delivery of information. Like if I'm giving a keynote, if you're giving a keynote to an audience, you're up at the head, 
they're sitting in chairs all facing you. Well, that is as it should, because you have to deliver that information to them, certainly at least a part of the presentation. Afterwards, you can have a Q&A. So there are times when absolutely uh, a grid array is the right thing to do. Kind of an interesting um, uh, product I recently came across, actually. Uh, Herman Miller um, a Furnishing uh, Company, very famous uh, office furniture company, has a table that's kind of a hybrid of the two. So if you can imagine an egg-shaped table, right? So it's rounded. It has a sort of a wider bottom like an egg, and then it kind of comes to a curved but narrower uh, front end. So this is kind of interesting because you could use it both for presentations. And by the way, I have no stock in Herman Miller. I'm not showing for them or anything. Um, but it's an interesting amalgam because you get that presentation mode. Okay, everybody's facing the screen at the end of the room. That's cool. But if you're not and you're kind of talking to each other, you get that non-hierarchical, more curved perimeter uh, collaborative effect at the same time without having to have two tables. So an interesting application of this uh, research in real world terms. So just a reminder before we wrap up today's show, Donald has kindly offered us a copy of his book to give away. So just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you can be in with a chance to win a brilliant copy of that book. And I'm going to finish the show with a beautiful quote I pulled from the book. I really, really enjoyed this one in particular. And it's peppered with these beautiful quotes throughout the book, which really shows Donald to me, your understanding of innovation, that it goes beyond strategy, it goes into mental models and how we think and how we are influenced by our environment, all these deeper things. Before I do before I quote that, where can people find you to find out more about your keynotes, your book, and indeed your work as an architect? Well, the book, My Creative Space, is available on all the usual online outlets, um, and hopefully as well in your local bookstore. Um, as far as um, myself, the best way to kind of learn more about what I'm doing and to learn more about the subject we've talked about is to go to my website, donaldratner.com. Very important. Ratner has two T's. Uh, it's spelled both ways, but I'm on the two T group. And in particular, there's a resources page, which I very deliberately set up to be a kind of nexus of information on the uh, study of physical space and its relationship to creativity and innovation. So it's got lots of books, not just mine blogs, academic programs, conferences, podcasts, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so I would certainly start with that. And then I am also on the usual social media sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Please feel free to connect with me there as well. So Donald, while I'm letting you think about how you're going to finish the show, I'm going to quote this beautiful quote, I mentioned there peppered throughout the book, I love this one in particular, you said, putting these tactics into practice isn't going to magically transform you into a creative superhero by itself. You've got to do your part to leverage your innate talents. That means investing in the time to practice your craft, remaining committed, persistent and motivated, staying open to innovative ideas and opportunities, being unafraid to be criticized or misunderstood, even rejected. These are difficult things to do, especially outside the home. In the workplace, we're pressured to conform to company standard and other people's expectations. At school, we're rewarded for coming up with a single right answer rather than many good answers. In neither environment are we free to shape our surroundings to reflect our vision of what the world should be. In neither place are we regularly permitted to act outside the norm, to take risks, to fail without automatic censure. Home is different. Home is your creative haven. Take advantage of the freedom and safety it affords by incorporating some or all of the suggested enhancers into your surroundings and routines. Stick with those you find valuable and discard the rest. We are people, not robots. All the science in the world can't predict how you as an individual react to the creativity catalysts described in these pages. The best scientific research can do is establish the probability that a design trigger or action will bolster creative performance among a broad population. The rest is up to you. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been a wonderful conversation. You know, there was so much in that quotation, it's, it's hard to know um, where to start without reiterating it all. But I think, you know, if there's any kind of silver lining to the health crisis we've gone through and hopefully will come out of in the not too distant future, it's that it 
I hope it's made folks more appreciative of what home is like and what it does for us. It is a really unique environment, uh, a unique space in the world. It's the one place we can kind of call our own, whether we are owners or renters. Um, and that separates it from the rest of the world in ways that are just, as I say, uh, unique. And one of the things that does is to kind of uh, grant us a, a degree of autonomy, a degree of, a degree of freedom that we can enjoy the moment we step out of that wall, uh, step beyond those walls. And that's a good thing because it does allow our minds to wander and explore and do all the things that creative and innovative people need to do, which is to break those boundaries, to go places that no one has gone before and not worry about what the rest of the world is going to look at. And hopefully some of that is going to carry over as we get back into the world, as we go back to the workplace. And certainly a lot of the signs are such that I think um, a lot more people now will be working from home at least maybe one day of the week or on an as needed basis to understand that these two different environments give us two different kinds of strengths to do what we need to do to carry forth to bring creative and innovative things into the world so i hope i've been uh, able to help that movement along just a little bit by lowering the barriers by showing folks how their environment doesn't have to hinder uh, their ability to come up with fresh and novel thoughts but can actually amplify them author of My Creative Space, How to Design Your Home to Stimulate Ideas and Spark Innovation, Donald Rotner. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan.